this week. So I got a whole week. You're good to go. Our first service, and for those who were wondering if we were going to change anything, I mean, no, we didn't really change anything. We still worshiped. We still are honoring and caring for Glory Reborn, just like we always would. We still received communion. Crystal still did the announcements and received the tithes and offering. We still love God. We still love people. We still want to build strong families. We still believe we need to connect to the community where we live and where we work and where we worship. We still believe we're called to connect to the different communities and connect them to Christ. We're still supposed to care for people. We're still supposed to cultivate their gifts. Like nothing's changed, and yet probably for some of you, it feels like everything's changed. What's old is new, what's new is old, all of that kind of stuff. So I want to... I'm going to segue into how many of you, is there anybody here besides my parents who know uh, or ever heard of Mount Baldy in Indiana? Anybody? I didn't think so. I'm not talking about my hairline either. Uh, So back in May of 1990, we were having our end of school picnic. It was held at the Indiana Dunes State Park, which is on Lake Michigan. It's actually a really Nice beach for being a lake beach. It's better than Galveston. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) We had a great time that day. We played games. We swam in the lake. We played football and soccer. We had a water balloon fight. We ate lunch. And after lunch, we had some free time to just hang out. And there was a bunch of people doing varying things. And I can remember with great clarity, I was running. I'm not going to run this morning. But I was running across the pavilion. And I looked left, and I saw a pink water balloon. And the next thing that I remember is a bunch of eighth grade doctors gathered around me as I was coming to. Yeah, a pink water balloon took me off my feet and literally knocked me out. Uh, That's pretty incredible. Uh, It's incredible I can remember that it was a pink water balloon. One of my closest friends at the time, his name was Ray, Uh, Being the great friend he was, I said, Ray, is everything going to be okay? He said, no, man, you look like crap. There's blood everywhere. (laughs) Thanks, Ray. (laughs) Teachers called my mom, and next thing I know, I'm at the hospital. Well, Guy Williams, if you ever meet Guy Williams, he intended that pink water balloon for Kelly Bickle. I happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see, normally a water balloon is fun and doesn't take people off their feet or knock them out. However, when they're launched from a three-man slingshot that was pulled back as far as it could be pulled back at about 75 feet away, so like, you know, from me to Paul and Manuela maybe, it was just pulled straight, maybe even closer, pulled straight back, and I just happened to be in the wrong place. I just, I do matrix slow motion, but we don't have those effects. Uh, I clearly... uh, don't remember a whole lot. I do remember this. I remember being at the hospital, and I'm sure my parents remember more than I do. But what I do remember is them saying, I was lucky I wasn't blinded. I mean, it hit me square, straight in the eye. That's how I know it was pink. Yeah. I clearly learned my lesson because we still use three-man slingshots to launch water balloons at kids every year at camp. We catch them in buckets, and we catch them in sheets. But we don't shoot them directly at kids, right? Like we shoot them straight up in the air and they, and they catch them. I, I'm going to circle back to this story in a little bit. This morning I want to read from Luke chapter 5 as our primary passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can open them there. Uh, it'll be on the screen for those who uh, would prefer to look there. Uh, for those who are visiting Grace or are new to Grace, I typically read from the New King James Version uh, unless I tell you otherwise. So... It says this in Luke chapter 5, verse 33. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. And he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. 
And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Okay, so what we just read was a brief encounter with the religious superior elite. These are those people who were having a hard time with the grace that Jesus was preaching and the means by which Jesus was obeying and fulfilling the law. They could not understand anything Jesus did because it didn't line up with the way they believed the Messiah or those who would be following the law should act. Jesus was at a party being thrown by the newest disciple, Matthew. Matthew, in his former life, was a tax collector, and that was just a few hours earlier. And now he's one of the 12 disciples. So the question about fasting has more to do with pious religious activity than it does about the actual act of fasting. Jesus answered their question, and he understood the depth of the question, and he gives them a cultural illustration that would have made perfect sense to them, but may need to be explained to us today. So I want to reread the last three verses of Jesus' parable. It says this, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. I'm not personally someone who's ever made wine from grapes. I'm not someone who understands the fermenting process except the bad milk that I found in our fridge over the years. I have friends that tell me uh, milk, over that has been aged is not something that's good. A wineskin is something that we don't really talk about today. It doesn't make sense to us today. We no longer store, carry, or use animal skins for wine. Uh, a wineskin was typically a pouch that was made out of either goat or sheepskin, and it was then filled with this new wine. New wine has not been fermented yet. It's not a bottle you just bought at the store. New wine must be fermented in order to get the correct taste. So what is the fermentation? Fermentation? I don't know how you say that word. What's that process? Hey, TJ. How are you? Good? It's great to be the pastor's youngest kid. You can do whatever you want. Fermentation is the chemical breakdown of a substance by bacteria, yeasts, or other microorganisms, typically involving effervescence and the giving off of heat. I'm helping the teenagers learn how to bootleg something in their bathtub. (laughs) The, The process of fermentation involved in the making of beer, wine, and liquor in which the sugars are converted into ethyl alcohol. Basically, fermentation is the process of a chemical change over time. If the proper amount of time is not given, then the proper changes are unable to happen. Practically, new wine, when poured into a wineskin for fermentation, it would bubble, it would expand uh, as the gases were released, and when it is in the new wineskin, the skin itself has to be able to fluctuate in size as the process takes place. However, the product is not something you would want to consume immediately. You put it in, and this, this wine skin is going to get bigger. It's going to get smaller as the gases are releasing, and the fermentation process is happening. After time, the wine develops a good flavor. The skin is now old. The wine is now old, and it's ready to be consumed. So 40 is not bad, man. I mean, you know, you're just getting better, right? Uh, for kicks, I Googled, like, the oldest bottles of wine and the most valued bottles of wine because I have no idea what this world holds. So... The number seven, uh, this is the, the seventh oldest bottle of wine. And I'm going to mess up these names. So if you know them, just know I'm messing them up right now. The Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Anybody know? Anybody got a guess when they think this was originally? Mary, you, you've been there probably. So when? 1787. Yeah. I, I should give you a prize, except these are for people who filled out cards. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's, it's actually valued at $156,000. Yeah, I know, right? Like, 
buy a house, drink a bottle of wine. Buy a house, drink a <laughs> bottle of wine. I don't know. Uh, so the, the sixth one is the Chateau Margaux. It was actually, uh, most people believe Thomas Jefferson owned it. Uh, it had a, a T and a J uh, inscribed on the bottle. Um, it was also in 1787 in France, and it's actually the most expensive bottle of wine never to be drunk. It was valued at $225,000 because after it was dropped, that's what the insurance carrier had to pay for it. Yeah, that's a bad day. <laughs> I don't know who dropped it, but I can only imagine the... Uh-oh. <laughs> Number five is uh, Massandra Sherry de la Frontera. It's from the Republic of Crimea in 1775. It's valued at 43000 The Here's one I should have had Laura come up and read. Uh, Rudsheimer Apostelwein. And it's German. Uh, forgive me for anybody who's German in here. Uh, it was 1727, and it's valued at 200000 This Tokaji sounds Japanese, but it's from Germany. Uh, the Royal Saxon Cellars, it was, okay, so we're getting old now. 1650 to 1690, there's no value on this, uh, not because it's not of value, but because they've never placed a value on it. The second one is the Strasbourg Wine Barrel, 1472. Like this, they still have this, 1472 in, in France. Again, no value. The oldest bottle of wine, and uh, it's not believed to be potable. Uh, there's that good word, Laura. That's the, that was the word of the week. Um, it's the Spire wine bottle. Anybody want to guess? Okay, you can't be. Uh, no, no, not the value, not the value, the age. 1250, what? 1480. 30, you're all wrong. 325 to 350 A.D. I mean, whoever found it, that's pretty incredible. Okay, none of this has anything to do with my message. I thought it was cool. Uh, Except that it takes time for things to become of value. So that was just a rabbit trail. When the new wine and new wineskins become old wine and old wineskins, the wineskin becomes formed and hardened. It no longer has the pliable flexibility it once had when it was new. If you put new wine into old wineskins, when the bubbles start and the gases begin to release, the old wineskin is going to bust, and then the liquid's going to be on the ground. Jesus was explaining a very understandable principle to those who were questioning his doctrine, his intentions, and his methods. He's basically saying, look, guys, I'm going to do the things... I'm not going to do the things the way you've always done it. I'm not going to live by your man-made rules. I'm going to live by my father's expectations. And here's the problem. If you try to figure it out and try to fit it in to the way that you've always done things, your head's going to explode like a wineskin with new wine. I mean, it's actually really practical. Don't try to place all of the things that I'm doing as I've come from heaven and I'm, I'm replacing or not replacing, I'm fulfilling the law. I'm fulfilling the covenant that I made to Moses, that I made to Abraham. I'm fulfilling these things and I, I'm beginning to explain to you that forgiveness is going to come through what I do on the cross. It's not going to come through an animal or the shed blood of an animal. It's not going to come from a priest who who will be a mediator because we don't need that any longer. We can go directly to our Father in Heaven. Basically, if you guys try to do things the way that you've always done them, your head is going to explode just like a wineskin. And as you would imagine, their heads were exploding every time he would heal on the Sabbath. Their heads would explode. Every time he didn't do things the exact way. And I, I, I think there was, I think there was, I think Jesus had fun doing that to them. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It doesn't say that. It's just my opinion. But I, I, I think there was a little bit of, <laughs> because he would continue to do things the right way, the new way, the way that it was always meant to be. And it continued to just tick people off. 
Jesus understood it would be hard to receive. And he understood it would be hard to be implemented. Because he says this. He closes that parable with this verse. Verse 39. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says the old is better. And I read that verse one time a few years ago. And it really caught my eye. Because if you, if you read that, Jesus is understanding. Look, guys, I know you like the way things used to be. I know you understand those things. I know that the old was good. And nobody wants to take the new and, and just consume the new. But you know what? The new becomes old over time. Nobody likes change. Nobody likes to do things differently than the way they've done it. Uh, Don't anybody raise their hand, and I mean it. Don't raise your hand. But if you've been to Grace and Southlake in the last, if you were there last week, last month, or even this year, how many of you are sitting in the same seat? Don't, Don't raise your hand. You're sitting in the same seat you sat in over there. Why? Because you don't like change. And it's the closest you can get to being in Southlake and being in the old building, except you're in a new building. But I'm in my same seat. We don't like change. How many of you are, well, we want to do things the way we've always done it because it's comfortable. We want to do things the way we've always done it because we've developed a palette for it. And we like it. Jesus, in his remarks about religion, is also explaining the very principle of change. No one who's experienced the good things of the past immediately want to do new things. You don't ever like a new worship song the first time. Sorry, Jason. You've got to hear it four or five times on the radio, and then the worship leader's got to get it just like it was on the radio. Good luck with that. And if they sing it any different, it's like they've completely ruined the song. We don't like new. How many of you live on yesterday's experience with the Holy Spirit? How many of you live on yesterday's word and promise instead of today's word and promise? How many of you are engaged in what the Holy Spirit is doing today? The new wine, it doesn't taste as good, but it may just be better than the old wine if you give it some time. We like the old ways, the old process, the old programs, and maybe even the old building. But guess what? The new wine will eventually become old. And we can't just expect the new wine and the new building and the new ideas and the new community to taste and look like the old wine in week one and month one and year one or maybe actually ever. God's given us a new wineskin. It happens to be an address and a building, but it's just a wineskin. It's just holding what he's about to do or what he's already doing in us and through us. For those who attend in North Creek, it's still a new wineskin. It, it looks somewhat different. It's a different person standing up here. It's a different team leading worship. It's just as new for anybody in this room today, whether you've gone here in this building or you've gone to grace your whole life. It will at times feel like the new wineskin is also holding the new wine. And the, We're going to expand and we're going to contract and we're going to expand and we're going to contract. And I'm not talking about the number of people, although it may also include the number of people. I'm talking about the things we invest in. I'm talking about the time and resources we invest. I'm talking about where we put our efforts. I'm super excited about what's happened at Heritage. And, 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 What Pastor Steve started, they've mentioned Pastor Steve Bontrager. By the way, Steve Bontrager and Leona Bontrager founded this church. Uh, They moved from North Richland Hills, and I believe the building opened. Somebody help me. I think it was 1999 or 2000 this building opened. Is that that correct? And, and, And so what Steve and Leona founded in this community, we're beginning to build on. And when I was in the school on, uh, so I may have committed you. To 52 Thanksgiving dinners for the families on the free and reduced lunch program. I might have committed you to going and being part of their reading program in the spring. I might have committed you to uh, lots of things. 
But guess what? Can I, can I just tell you, I was in one 30-minute meeting that was followed by 30 minutes afterwards with the principal, the assistant principal, the, um, one of the teachers, and I'm sorry, the counselor, the school counselor. I couldn't come up with a word. Uh, and in that 30 minutes following that meeting, what the Lord was just doing was absolutely incredible. And I came back and I found my wife and I said, you're not going to believe this. And I just began to spew all of the things that, that happened in that meeting. And can I tell you what went through my mind is there are doors that no man can open and there are doors that no man can close, and there are doors that God can open, and there are doors that God can close. And I really, I, I genuinely just felt like every door that we knocked on, when it came to the schools only, I'm talking about in South Lake, we could never get it open. We knocked, and we knocked, and we kicked, and we, we <laughs> banged, and we used our shoulders. Sometimes we used our head, and it hurt. And before we had one service, the Lord was already... Like really, truly, the incredible amount of opportunity that's going to happen at Heritage Elementary, it's, it's all because of what Steve and Leona started and what we have the ability to continue. I am grateful. I am thankful. But the gases are expanding and they're contracting and they're expanding and they're contracting. And we're in this new wineskin right now. And yet the old tasted good. And we were comfortable. It was a shorter drive for some of you. Now it's a shorter drive for others of you. It, it's different. you got to go a different route. You have to think differently. I bribed you with donuts and <laughs> gift cards and like all kinds of things. So that I, I, I put a 13-day a countdown. You're probably annoyed with seeing numbers on social media. God is, I'm telling you, going to create an incredible old wine from the new wine that's being started right now. Jesus changed everything with grace and mercy. Jesus explained human nature regarding finding grace and mercy with an illustration of a wineskin. we got to remember forgiveness is given by the Father, not by a sacrifice of an animal. And we can now directly go to Him. I've already said that this morning. We're no, we no longer have to have a man or a priest or a rabbi do the talking to God for us. We get to just say, Jesus, I need to have a conversation with you. I, I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but if you've ever watched Evan Almighty, which is not a religious movie, not even close, it doesn't really happen like that. It wasn't in D.C., in case anybody's wondering, the flood wasn't in D.C., um, and Congress wasn't wiped out, although, uh, well, never mind, you do what you want to with that. The way that Steve Carell, who plays Evan, um, and Morgan Freeman, who plays God, interact, changed how I think about prayer. Because I actually think that's how we should pray. It's just a conversation with the Lord. If you're using these and thuses and thous when you're talking to God, he does understand it, but you don't have to do that. It's just a conversation with our Creator that we get to have because of the veil that was torn. As we move forward, I want to say at times it might be tight because the gases have expanded. It might be loose because the gases have released. But in the end, it's going to be incredible. So back to the pink balloon. These really do tie together. <laughs> A three-man slingshot is not bad. It's not. I love shooting water balloons out of a three-man slingshot. And I don't know anybody who's taken it worse than I did. I believe a three-man slingshot also describes where we're at today. It has been pulled back as far as it can be pulled back, and the water balloon launched when Jason started singing this morning. And either it can be launched and we can be propelled forward into an incredible future, or it's going to slap you in the face. And I think you get to choose. We are in new. There is change. The walls aren't the same color. The chairs aren't the same color. They're not even in the same layout. I mean, it was an older layout at Grace, but not the one that we just had. This is incredible. 
this is better than what we had in South Lake. I don't know if you would know that or not, but the amount of work and effort that Jason, Paul and Manuela built the frames for these, these white things. Um, so here was how that went down. I said to them, I think we should have white just hanging from the ceiling. And I think it'll absorb light. It'll be really cool. And Paul and Manuela and Jason and Todd and Justin put all of this incredible together from that one comment. This is better than what we had. God is doing incredible new things. And I really do believe we've been launched. It's been pulled back and it's been being pulled back for a long time. And the stretching has been hard. It's been challenging. And I don't know that all of you would even know all of the challenges and all of the stretching that's taken place. But it's, and if you've ever seen youth pastors do this, they get two guys, one on either side, and those guys, their one job is to hold the thing like this. And if, they, if their arm locks, the thing's going to shoot like this real quick. So they got one guy here with their arm locked, and you got the other guy over here with, with their arm locked, and you got one guy, and I don't know how you get the good job of, of pulling the thing back, but you're like, and this is how you do it. you like, I don't know why we bounce, but we do. And we, and, we, and we pull it back as far as we can. And then we try a little bit more because <laughs> we want to see how far we can shoot this thing. And then we let it go. And there's times the water balloon actually explodes right there. <laughs> that ain't going to happen with this, but it does happen. There's times it goes exactly where we're shooting it. There's time, so we do this thing at camp. If you've ever been to camp, we will shoot it probably to like Casey Tice. You think we shoot it to the sign out there? I mean, we shoot it a long ways. So, I mean, we just, when we pull this thing back and we launch that thing and it, it goes up in the air and sometimes we overshoot them big time. <laughs> That's usually intentional. Can you ever see 30 people holding a sheet try to start all moving together to go backwards to try to catch it? It's not going to happen, but it's funny to watch. <laughs> We've been launched, guys. And that water balloon's either going to go... The water balloon's going. What happens with it is up to you. We are a new wineskin. Old wine, old wineskin... New wine, new wineskins. We kind of have both of those things going at once. But here's what I know, and here's how I want to begin wrapping this up. God gave me a word last January of 2018. I preached about it for four months. You guys were tired of it. But it's, it was talking about this moment right now. Isaiah 43, 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. We're not going to live by the way we've always done things. So if you're from grace and you've been here forever, it's not going to look the same. He's doing a new thing. That Do not remember the former things. It's not about forgetting the past or forgetting what God did. It's about don't try to recapture what happened in the past and do it the exact same way because he wants to do it a new way. That's why he talks about roads in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. If you, re, if you would remember, the children of Israel were going to be released from Babylon and they could have gone the same way that they did when they left Egypt, except that's not what the Lord wanted them to do. They wanted them to go a different way, so they couldn't do it the same way they had always done it. They had to find a new way to do it. Yet God gets the glory. Isaiah chapter 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
Now listen to what else it says there because we stop there. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. It's very possible that as we move forward into our new and preferred future of the Lord, that things won't make sense. But the steps of faith that don't make sense oftentimes lead to the, the peace and the joy and the fields and the mountains clapping and we're going to rejoice because we will prosper. His word's not going to return void. The last scripture I'm going to read this morning. And, and I've received, I received a word from Andy. I received a word from Dad and they're all good and they're all right uh, about the temple and about what God's doing and the authority and the, the anointing we have. And I don't, want to, I don't want to diminish them. I want to tell you yes and amen, uh, but not right now. Uh, it's, it's for a, a moment in the future. Dad's was about the, the anointing of the temple and what God did when, when Solomon happened at the temple. And I, I intend to quote a portion of that passage of Scripture. And Andy's was about this new season and the authority that God has given us. And they're really incredible. But here's what Haggai says. For thus says the Lord of hosts once more. It is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. Now listen. This actually happened. And I believe it's going to happen again when Jesus comes back. And I believe it's happened in our life as a church family. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill the temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine, and the gold is mine. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And all I can say is, let it be so. God's not through with Grace Community Church. And the next 37 years are going to be more amazing than the first 37 years. And the seeds that were planted by North Creek are going to be great. The harvest is going to be greater than they ever could have imagined. Not because of me, not because of this staff, but because God's word does not return void. It's got nothing to do with us. It has to do with the promise that God's not a liar. So he's not done. When, if you haven't finished filling out your card, you better do it because we're about to collect them. When Solomon dedicated the temple, they throw this incredible party. And there's all kinds of worship and there's all kinds of praise. And in the middle of it, God says to Solomon, and you've heard me quote this before, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will heal their land. Then I will answer their prayers. I've said this before, but I want to say it again. He's not talking to North Fort Worth. He's talking to you and me. If my people, you are his people. I know it's the children of Israel at the time. We've been grafted in. Pretty incredible. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. If we're going to step into really, truly all that God has, we have to humble ourselves. We have to make the decision to turn from our wicked ways. And God's going to do incredible things. Would you stand? I'm going to have you sit back down in a second, but I don't know. There's something holy about standing. Not really, I just want to see who's sleeping. (laughs) In whatever capacity you would view surrender, so, you know, if somebody walks up to you with a gun and says, stick them up, that's surrender. Sometimes we get on our knees as a sign of surrender. However, you would show your act of surrender. 
I want to just surrender to the Lord. I want to just humble to the Lord for just a second. I know we're long, and for those who are visiting, I'm, I am 90% of the time, 95% of the time, done at 1130. It's different today. Lord, my hands are raised as a sign of surrender. And one act of surrender is not make for a life of humility. But it is a start. And as a church, Lord, as one family, whether the people that are here will ever come back to this church again or they will come back every week or every time we have a service for the rest of their lives, today, in this moment, we are humbling ourselves and we are saying, thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank you, Lord, for the seeds that were planted before. Thank you, Lord, for the seeds that were planted in South Lake before. Thank you, Lord, for the harvest we're about to uh, step into and receive. Thank you for all of the sweat and tears and hard work. Thank you for those who have said, let it be so, let it be done. Thank you for those who have prayed. Thank you for those who worked all of the incredible hours to get to this place in this moment right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord, for the doors that are already opening in the schools and in this community. Thank you, Lord, for those who are already asking questions because there's a new sign, because there's a banner outside, because there's cars in the parking lot. Thank you, Lord, that you are going to allow us to speak the truth that Jesus Christ is alive today, and the only way to heaven is to repent and call on him as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you because we're going to go out and we're going to do the things that you've asked us to do. And Lord, we want to go out in your joy and in your peace. We want to go out in the capacity of knowing that we have humbled ourselves and we have turned from our wicked ways and now you are healing the land. Lord, heal the land in, in this zip code. Heal the land in the zip codes where we live. Heal the land in the zip codes where we work, God. You've called us to influence where we live and where we work and where we worship. And now we have an opportunity in this zip code to influence where we worship here. Nothing's changed in the command. This is a different location. But I want to go out in a position and a posture of, of humility so that you will hear our prayers, so that you will heal the land. Lord, healing the land will look like families coming back together. Healing the land will look like salvations. Healing the land will look like you doing new and incredible things, not, not, not because of us, in spite of us. Lord, we're not more special. We're just your children. And I want to lead as a willing vessel. And Lord, I pray that those who are here will follow. Not me, but you. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay.